I've first one applied to several studies. Several studies is being organised for March next year, date to be applied. Um, if you go to aids.io, you will see the landing page and then there's a sessionised link halfway down and you can submit your, um, your talks. So we want to see all your talks. Talk about anything, um, whatever you're doing service wise and um, show. So you've got a good location. Hopefully you get. So that's, that's the plan. So you can hope. So, so, yes. um, welcome, my name is Matthew Lard. I'm a technical principal at Contino. So we're a digital transformation uh, organisation. We help clients do cloud, all the clouds, um, on our AWS ambassador as well. Uh, uh, we help basically code all the projects with clients and help hand it over, you know, so there's no overall community. Scenario. Hopefully the client is better off at the end after we've finished and we've gone to, to a new engagement. Um, usually that's the um, <laughs> all with the stage of So today I'm going to talk about um, either infrastructure background, not the software dev background. Uh, I would like to go. So, um, due to recent events in the media, um, there's been a few, let's say, security incidents in the last couple of months, well, last few years. Oh, uh, what's that? Just my one. Yeah, just my one. <laughs> <laughs> the news is still happening this week. But um, we, I guess, for me, it's frustrating to see this sort of stuff because it's easily avoided. Saying that it's easily avoided because it's actually is easily avoided by <laughs> things. So the genesis for this talk is just I can't do the whole, you know, a threat modeling. You could do a whole day of threat modeling. Talk, workshop. Um, but I just want to pick on a couple of little little things and a little bit of have a little bit of security background. Uh, basic serverless example um, and basic mitigation, which I, as a non coder, could code up in a few days. Um, go, I'm going to go as well, so I thought I learned the language at the same time as writing this talk. Um, to, just to demonstrate the possibilities of what, what, what can be done. It's not code that we can use in production, but we can use concepts. And my takeaway today for you all is I believe that serverless helps make this security easier for people who just don't um, your threat your landscape is a lot smaller which I'll, I'll point out that as we go along. So something that I didn't know necessarily, I kind of did but there's some stats here that, that I thought were kind of interesting. So any organization in Australia that um, is supposed to comply with the Privacy Act of 1988, are supposed to report to the uh, Office of Australian Information Commission of any breaches containing personal information that can be committed. And a combination of fields as well. Um, back to the government. Um, and then they'll, you know, keep on the what they do. <laughs> they probably help respond, they keep track of that, and, um, yeah, I guess it's a, it's a way to be accountable to the Australian public and see how they're improving. So, um, these latest stats that were available, uh, it's only the six months of life, last six months of last year. So up so for the last six months of 2021, stats for this year, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, there was that many. 70 like per month, average 70 to 80. Like I didn't know that. Like privacy breaches that probably weren't in the media because they were so small, I'm guessing. I don't know the size of them, but 
um, to me, that was kind of um, interesting. They also track the sources of data breaches. So, um, let's just look through more tap of those, of those stats. It's actually the other half. The other half is something that was also equally ridiculous in that human error um, was the cause. And human error is me emailing out data to people that shouldn't receive that data. Right? Um, it's something that should never happen. And that's not even technical problem as such, that's just a process problem. So the response to that usually is not that she buys that person, which is probably not the correct response. The correct response would be to look at their processes and say, you fix that, maybe buy the, you know, the executive involved or something. Um, so you don't buy the people who may buy it. So it's a bad structure. So cyber attack objectives. Um, Usually a, a criminal or whoever is attacking whoever is after assets. And assets are really only four things. Right? So you have money, they want money, usually. Or they want data to get money. You, know, you can combine, combine them up if you want. Uh, they might want computing resources. They might, you know, might want to do Bitcoin mining or whatever. I want to cause chaos, like, for example, the swing sense, and like that is slightly chaotic. But, you know, it's a general service or that sort of thing, or rig an election. So, enterprise security culture has a lot to, 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 to say about this. Well, actually, it doesn't have a lot to say, that's the problem. So, I guess, um, I think having cyber organisations siloed away from the reality of what products are being delivered causes massive problems because usually they're not that uh, knowledgeable. Not, not all cyber teams, hashtag not all cyber, but a lot of them are um, not skilled up appropriately. They have a check, checkbox mentality and um, there's no Prioritization, proper prioritization. So a lot of the time they'll bring the tool in, which is almost as bad as a checklist. So in the old days they had a checklist that everyone had like. And today they have the tools that they implement, which comes up with a field of red. And there's a project, 12 month project to get rid of the Which is not great, so bad. Uh, another problem is application teams just want their apps to work. They'll do what not all app teams are doing, but a lot of them will they have to deliver a functionality with the rule that they can. It, it meets the functional requirements, but does it meet the non functional requirements? Um, and the other problem is cloud guardrails are deployed inconsistently. Cloud guardrails could be governance around your AWS accounts, or two accounts, or whatever cloud you're using. And, you know, sometimes they might be a work in progress, which is fine, but they might not cover, again, it's around uh, prioritising the highest areas of the threats with the debt teacher. Um, other guardrails could be scripts that you deploy, you know, CloudFormation, um, checks, and Terraform, you know, modules that help deploy. Uh, applications, um, you know, the compliant consistent way. Now, there's always different ways, different, different ways of deploying the network. But again, it's just about prioritization. So, everyone said the security is everyone's responsibility. It's the app team deploying the app. It's also ops, and it's also um, the organization as a whole. Everyone needs to be on the same path. And if everyone is treating it seriously, even if you're overlapping, you know. Uh, so has anyone heard about threat modeling? Do it regularly um, and document it in the way. So 
a lot of people, so Molly is actually not that complicated, and a lot of the time people probably do it without even realising it. Um, but what we're going to do is just try and do a basic example, put some improvements along the way to show the um, threats coming in. So terminology is very important. So about so in threat modeling, um, a vulnerability is basically a weakness in the system, central weakness in the system, you know, unpatched, poor type, and misconfiguration, and all stuff. The threat is an event that happens which exploits a vulnerability. The risk is actually the probability of that threat occurring and the risk combined in that. A low risk and a high impact, or a high risk and a impact. All my data is not open to something like that. Risk, a lot of the time, risk and threat can be used interchangeably, and usually it is in my experience, which is fine as long as everyone understands that if you're doing a risk assessment, you need to actually have some subjective idea about probability and impact, or it's pretty much useless. Because you can't break things. And usually organisations have had their own. I don't know. Like a, you know, they're like a matrix where the highs and lows, you know, different combination of highs and lows depending on that organisation's um, culture. From a requirements perspective, we're going to build an internet accessible API, pretty common requirement. Um, the user's going to sign up and provide some basic information, name, address, password number, it's uh, pretty common these days. Keep the PII secure from unauthorized access, so you probably want to do that. And Deleting the data we no longer require. This is the one where trips organisations up because they make statements to the government to say it's too hard for us, you don't want to do that. Uh, because it's you know, too hard, so we don't want to do that. I think that's going to change. So, um, the first iteration, please bear with me, it's not so nice, I know, um, but I'm going to make a point. So your first part of the threat modeling is what? Draw a diagram. And it doesn't, it can be, if you look at stuff on, online, you know, it could be data flow diagram, infrastructure diagram, it doesn't matter. Draw a diagram and draw the flows. So here we've got the API requests going from a user on the left to an API running on an EC2. And then you've got response traffic coming back. Um, the other thing of note on this diagram is we've got trust boundaries. So that's what the dotted lines are. So again, this can be subjective. This trust boundary, maybe, you know, people could argue it's here. It depends on the setup of the infrastructure where that trust boundary is. In theory, within a trust boundary, everything is trusted. But when you cross trust boundaries, that's when you want to make sure you do it. That's potentially where vulnerability is going to go up. So it helps, you know, get the trip and what things look like. So once you've got a diagram for the purposes of today, I'm just going to put some example effects. Um, this particular architecture. Um, notice we've got a VPC. Once you have a VPC and you see twos, you have a whole range of risks that you've got to do. So, you know, that on network movement. If, I, if there's a vulnerability on an EC2, I can, you know, do stuff within the account, within the environment. I can move around potentially. And uh, something that I have to, you know, protect against. Um, but the other thing is we have 
potentially unauthorized access to API. If I'm running, say, a Python API server, I don't have to keep that patch to the right sort of things. Uh, it could have, you know, problems with it, or bugs, or whatever. Um, and then on the database side, unauthorized access to the database, so that's really good. So I'm going to start with filtration, which again we've seen a little bit of. Um, so once you've got your risks, you can put you've got your threats, they aren't even there. You put your risks in. So in this environment, without any other knowledge, everything to me is high without any other information. Now platform teams might already mitigate a lot of these things, and that's fine. Um, make sure it's documented, adjust this risks and that's the So second iteration of this architecture. It's a lot better. It's missing. Yes. So what, what's that? And the elephant. And the elephant. <laughs> so um, we could still have the elephant but I'm missing that. Um, with, with no VPC suddenly a whole range of vulnerabilities and threats disappear because um, but you still have the application level, right? So infrastructure-wise, things disappear, application level, things stay. Um, and in this case, I'm using API Gateway, which could, could still be used for um, um, You can still have a misconfiguration of the API Gateway quite easily. That's why your guardrails are called to make sure people don't do that. Um, is known as a fat lambda here. Um, again, it's okay because it's serverless, right? We like serverless, but um, it's still doing multiple things, right? And when you're doing multiple things, you have more, more permission than potentially. You know. And database wise, I'll put Dynamo in here just because that's what my demo is. Uh, could, still, could be in the server database. Again, you've got a whole platform disappeared from you that you don't have to worry about. You still have to deal with the database, um, and you still have to you still have to create a data situation. I've changed the uh, risks to lower in this model, but I've put threaded data exfiltration while medium because it's a little bit harder to get to. It's not low yet. Third one, this is the last diagram. Uh, we have, uh, yeah, it's pretty much the same thing as the previous one, except we've split the lambdas out. One's dealing with gets, which means it's just read only data, and one's dealing with posts, which means it's just write. So, again, we can scope down your lambda roles using IAM to actually obtain uh, access to the nodes. Again, same risks. Um, I could load for most of them now because there's less access to the database. Um, there's still a threat of data exfiltration because I haven't mentioned anything about encryption. Um, there could be encryption of the DynamoDB layer, platform layer, but that's only one part of it, the issue, right? Because if my database is encrypted with an application layer, it's got to be unencrypted for my application to work. So um, that's that's one of the problems I have with the yeah, responses to that. Oh, the data was encrypted. Well, actually, no, it wasn't. <laughs> so if we encrypt the fields that we don't want people to see, um, that was you not know, going to be that's the point that I want to make today. Um, I hope that I've also added some extra uh, ingress points to the network. Don't forget you have no human access to the account, you still have a CLCD pipeline that can access the account. There's actually, there's more risks. So again, I'll just put a demonstration of the potential risks. You also have You've got to scope down the CRCD, um, make sure only people who can use it have it, and all that sort of thing. And same for human administration as well. So a whole threat workshop would come as an output, have all the risks, it might take a few hours, 
owners, philatists, and the equations and have you. So, if you're going to mitigate against data exfiltration with application encryption, how would you go about it? Would you have a single encryption peak or all the data? Um, because if I get the key for all the data, then I can unencrypt it. So it's, it might be, you know, slightly better, but it's still not ideal. What about a single encryption key per customer? Key per customer. So again, if it's just like a, a telco or a app, um, you can have lots of, there's lots of different ways of dealing with it, you have multiple databases, you can have a key per customer, and instantly you have a way to, you um, have to speak Japanese, but there's tools for that, and the secret to manage that, KMS, the KMS key per customer could be expensive, but secret to manage uh, and my view is that, that's the cost of doing business because, yeah. and I think it's 40 cents per secret, I mean, something like that. You know, it's still a high number, but you get that. It took a bit of trouble. And again, there's ways to, to keep that cost. Um, there is a problem with, oh, okay, I'm giving the answer. There is a problem with an encryption key per customer, um, and means all your services have access to that key by customer data. You can re encrypt again with a service key. So you can encrypt once with a key per customer, and you can uh, service key, which could be payments, because that makes things easy. You might only have 10 services and 10 payments, keys, for example. Service to put the data in, uh, has permissions to encrypt using other services' keys, but it can't be encrypted. Right? So, um, Passport service, which has permissions to put the passport for nothing else. So, splitting it out like that might make sense. That's, that's basically the architecture. So, creating a record that I'm you know, signing up to a service and providing my PII data. Um, I, the Lambda function takes, takes care of that request. It creates a unique encryption key per customer and encrypts that data, stores that key in the secrets manager. And then and the, the encryption algorithm for that look, there's plenty of you know trustworthy libraries out there to be able to do that. Then data key from KMS, I think I'm not talking. Once that data is encrypted, then step three is to grab that ciphertext then get to the service key, and then you've got site checks that only that service can do print. And then you can store that um, service name site text into your database. Again, DynamoDB is the example, but it could be a serverless friendly database. Or well, not serverless friendly, you could do this, not serverless as well. Bit of SAM, I'm using SAM um, for this. So, this is so if no one's seen SAM before, you basically define your function. Um, so, we'll start with question. You define your your function, where your code is, and your policy. So, it's a, really, it's not difficult. Um, because it's a user get function, it has a read only policy for the data with a scope down table name. We have read only secrets manager permissions to get the se secrets for you know the keys for the users. Obviously, you'll need that. Again, you could potentially do some smart around that based on authorization stuff, but, but that's a little bit more complex. Um, and then the only thing that user get function needs from a service key perspective is decrypt of its key for it. So the user service might only be able to decrypt the name, might only be able to decrypt this. That's what this example is. So, and then there's a bit of code here. 
Um, so the benefit of having a key per user is that you have basically there's a call to secrets manager there. Um, if they get an error because the key's been deleted, customer data has been deleted, I could either put an empty string or a ciphertext I can't believe it with it. So now, um, if I don't have that, if the encrypted field is empty, then I'll just decrypt the field. And I'll pass my, I use the to do example, but I haven't changed the variable name. Um, User.address, the key of the service, and the data, the decrypted data from, uh, sorry, the key from Secrets Manager, and then decrypt field just takes care of your mm -hmm. Um, another tip, um, so decrypt field, if you're looking at decrypt field, storing the data is by 6 and 4 is a good idea because sometimes it's simple to data one not necessarily using it back in time. So if you play 64 and code it, you know you can safely store it pretty much in any database in the field. Um, you're just decrypting with that service key that I passed through and then a second decrypt with the unique user key that I passed through and that's it. So um, I have a quick demonstration. Always fun when I'm not facing the screen. By the way, there's built-in tool to stop your screen display going off the side. So here I'm posting a user called Mr. Robot to my API, prod user. Uh, I'm giving a name, an address, and a passport number, which is not real. So I get a response with address, ciphertext, and passport ciphertext. And then if I the address, but it doesn't get the password because it doesn't know how to see that. But I have a password service. Oops, <laughs> and it does. So password service doesn't see an address, but it sees a password. So having the same person handle the keys of the app, probably not a great idea. Um, so separation of concerns is always important in a situation like this. You can have a key policy so you like, you can have a secret to manage the policy so you like, but if one person can change everything, then Got separate keys, separation of concerns, separate things, and maybe a separate account. Um, then that's that's always done. And I could do a quick deletion of that. So I don't know what I do. If I delete this too, that scheduled deletion is basically deletion. You get a different API code back. Get the data. It says it's too deleted. And if I didn't put the friendly response in there, I just thought, you know, you don't know that. So that's the demo. Um, the other interesting thing is that it will write. So it's 
someone's got to read down access to the data to build and put in the data and put in the console to lock down all those permissions. It's about this for each. Um, that's good. So, just closing up, uh, there's different threat model methodologies. Microsoft Slide is a very popular one. So, what this can help with is having a grouping of different types of threats. There's a whole on the website, there's some links there um, that um, um, the different categories. Uh, of different um, uh, threats, and it can help you know surface things that you might not have thought about, you know, things that you need to look at in the future. Um, elevation of privilege is, is a good one as well. Um, so, data information is like they're all you know, standard things. There are other models out there. Good one's your friend. An example threat model um, template is, doesn't really matter as long as. You document it somehow, and in summary, um, security is everyone's responsibility. Everything should be able to reach. Right, that's the um, not relying on one fault. Control for protection. They're the examples that we've seen in the media. Right on things that have failed, basically. And if you do that and you encrypt your data, then all the hackers started to function with the text. And it's, you know, this stuff's not hard. Complexity of threats. Um, the other thing that I should have put in the summary is how it puts the threats. So that's, that's my talk. That's in backup slides. But that's pretty much the on the set. That's what I want to share today. Like, what, what shows in, in the API is, how should I explain? I think in the, um, in the API, it has, like, more parameters than what it's showing in the UI. Like, would, would this be able to, like, solve this problem as well? Well, so, I think what, so the second part of the question, because I remember that one first, um, the, your API really should only return what it needs yes. for the UI. I guess that's what you're calling yeah. right. And absolutely, absolutely correct. Not only do you have least privilege for your operations and your code and everything running, you have least privilege for your application from a client side. So, um, in fact, you can enforce that. So you can do that with O2. You know, you can really scope down what information comes back based on who's authenticated, right? I can only see my son. Um, unfortunately, you know, when your database got left to you know, a large company, um, nothing is encrypted, and the API wasn't encrypted, but it wasn't authenticated, no authorization, so we just, you know, pulled it in the document. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, first part of the question again. Oh, is threat modeling always oh, yeah, yeah. with, uh, like, because, like, I think what I see in, like, the company that I used to work for is, like, I think they start with, like, pen and paper, and then they'll be, like, consultants who, like, no, like, you should do this, and then they have, like, more Excel spreadsheet. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so, so, yeah, I'm a consultant, and if you ask me to come and do your first modeling for you, don't, you know, I will not do that. You know your data, you know your application, I can help you with some, you know, guidance, you know, things to look for, but it needs to be done, multidiscipline team, right, infrastructure, applications, security, everyone needs to be there. But yes, you can have tools to do it as well, so it's that security tooling, that's probably more for operations to make sure you're compliant. You can't really, I don't know if you can automate, I'm not aware of anything that could automate. So, 
Like a like, AWS, like, I don't know, so, some, I know services to like, so these, are the, these are the APIs that you have, and these are like our, our recommended models. That's good. That's good. Is, is that some of the trusted bias that you do for in some ways? I don't think so. Kind of the implement, maybe. Around the network, they can tell you some basic things like if they're nested in bucket open. Yeah, it's not quite. Yeah. Not quite. So I guess there's two levels. You've got a control point. And we've got the downline. The top line, absolutely, you know, best. And I know those have the best practices, well architected, uh, security, security box. Well architected trust with security 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 the best thing you can do there is do the best you can and then have a pen test. Penetration test. See what they can do. That's the answer. I don't just have one more thing. Yeah. General purpose APIs that deliver data are very attractive because they're quick and easy to build. But general purpose APIs expose your data to way too many people, which comes back to your point of keeping it narrow. I think a lot of companies like general purpose APIs, like big enterprises love general purpose APIs, and government. Loves general purpose APIs, mm -hmm. and there's a thousand reasons why they shouldn't. Yeah. Anyone who develops general purpose APIs, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I will say that on the record. Yeah. Anyone who does that, join us on a five if you do. <laughs> 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 yeah, I think it's good. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Ye
from the money more account from the network houses in the AWS that you say, and it has full success to so one thing, one, one thing on my wish list regular list, Lambda, is to have a tick box to say isolate all of my Lambdas from the general exam. And that would be magical. So I can manage. Because what, so what I do, what I'm, what I'm playing with at the moment where I work is we actually deploy into a private PPC all that Lambdas that mm -hmm. don't need any outside mm -hmm. controls. And then use, then use private endpoints so I can talk to services. So you've got complete control over where things are going. And they're only talking to your account. So there's, there's pros and cons. And the other thing I'll make is there are ways, even though it has full address in there are ways of dealing with that, right? You can inspect your code and have a SAS and It really depends on your company's risk posture. And doing something is still better than that. Doing, you know, as long as you're thinking about all different scenarios and putting your data, you get that or you sit down. Now doing best you can. But yes, I work with a lot of them. It's going to go through the same. It's a whole bit of visibility. Just so on, but it's obviously the system is set up that way. Even uh, when we can put a firewall in place from one endpoint to another, for example, uh, from Lambda to retrieve the secret manager also, we can put a firewall to uh, allow or uh, jail yeah. bomb. Well, yes, yeah, so 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 okay. so so secret. Sorry, that's the thing I didn't mention. We have a key policy which allows access to the high end and also the key policy side. I don't think those sorts of connections are usually inherently more secure because you're controlling everything.